from, from UWC and Absala. And uh, Absala University in physics uh, department, physics and astronomy department. So I won't say a lot about Cedric, but you will see exactly why we decided to invite him to UWC. So Cedric, I won't say a lot about you because we know Cedric at, at UWC and we will see exactly what is it that Cedric brings to this first, to our first uh, seminar in, in, the, in the multimodality uh, environment. Thank you so much, Cedric. Over to you. Thanks, Okay, well, good afternoon again. Sorry for the, the delay. Um, I think you'll, you'll see, just for those who don't know, so basically what I do is I work some of the time at UWC and I work some of the time at Uppsala University in Sweden. <coughs> and so I'm kind of backwards and forwards there. And how I got to be in Sweden is we had set up this research group here at UWC, and at that time, it was the best rated research group in the field of physics education research in the country, and Uppsala University found out about it, and they asked me to go there for two years, and that was 17 years ago. So somehow, they managed to uh, keep me there longer. Uh, but I spent about uh, several months of the year at, at, at UWC. Now, this morning, or this afternoon, what I want to, uh, I don't, I don't know how well you know the theoretical groundings of what I'm going to be speaking about. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make a mixture. I, 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 there's some stuff that's practical stuff that I will show as a practical example, but I also need to introduce some theoretical constructs to you. And uh, probably the worst way to introduce theoretical constructs, as you probably know, is to simply tell people. But um, it's interesting. When we have conferences, that's how you do it. Um, I don't know how you do it, but I, I don't know whether you want to leave questions for the end or whether you want to pe let people ask as they go along. What do you want to do? How do you normally work? Normally, leave a bit of time at the end. Right, okay. So, now what about we're starting late? Does this mean that people have to go? What's the situation? How much time do I have? That's what I'm asking. Do I have the, do we have the hour still? Yeah. yeah okay. Good. Right. So I, what I'm going to talk about is the, the communication and representations that we use to, to share knowledge and ways of knowing. And I'm coming from a, a, a perspective that says the only way that we can share knowledge is through different forms of representation. That's the only thing that we have. So it's not, it's not this kind of idea that this is a real glass, and when I show you a photo of the glass, that's a representation. It's not that usage of the word. Calling this a glass is a representation as well, because there are some people who may not recognize this as a glass. They may not know what they may call as a, a, a cup or, or something like that, or not even know what it is at all. So. Let me start off, I, I just, so in, in Uppsala we have this research team and we, uh, we've got a very, very, very nice research grant that, uh, and we've had repeated research grants in this area now for three times in a row. And we this last research grant, very, very uh, and these people play uh, some of the most critical roles. The first two, Trevor, a Fort Wayne, I hope some of you recognize him, he's a UWC employee, he's a lecturer in physics department. So he's currently doing a PhD with us in Sweden. And John Eri is a, a, what we would call an associate professor at Stockholm University. Uh, Suzanne Wigman is an associate professor at Linnaeus University. And Anne Binder is a researcher in, uh, in my research group in Uppsala. Uh, Anne and Suzanne are basically the people that are working in chemistry and Trevor and John in the physics side. And I just I'm going to use chemistry and physics examples. I know that you come from more different disciplines, but uh, that's the easiest way for me to unpack the field. Right. Very quickly, this is the outline. I'm, I'm going to sort of uh, talk about the relevance. Why, why, is, why is it having a in social semiotic terms? Why, what's relevant about thinking about your teaching in these terms? Why would that be relevant? Why would anybody want to do it? Sounds like 
crazy language. And then I want to introduce some social semiotic ideas. Now, if you have been working in multimodality, you know this, you'll know that in typically like the ideas that come from social scientists, these are very flexible and manual. So people have different disagreements and agreements about what meanings are. So I'll be sharing with you how our research group think about certain things. And then I'm going to use, after taking you through that, I'm going to try and show you some pragmatic uh, outcomes. So I'll show you how you can use this idea to theorize about what happens in your classroom. And I'll take just use a, an example to do that. All right, so let's start. Let's look at about this relevance. So to, to begin, what I'd like to do is um, start with two quotes. Um, maybe you're familiar with this or not, but let's have a look at that. First of all, the, this is by a guy called David Nelson, who's born now physics education research in the United States. He says, the instructor's view of the ease or difficulty of a particular representation in a particular context might not match the views of a large proportion of students. So the particular context would be your classroom, for a particular object of learning that you're talking about, and then it just might not be a match at all. And then Andy Northwich, who's a sociologist, he's talking about university teachers' thoughts are so deeply rooted in specialist language that they're unaware that meanings that they take for granted are simply not construable from outside of their discourse. So, if you can imagine in the discipline or the field that you work in, there must be certain kinds of ways of talking about things that somebody outside would have no idea what you're talking about. And so this is what he's talking about. So when you become so familiar with it, so I, I'll give you an example. So I'm living in Sweden and I'm giving a talk in English. Everybody's sitting there is Swedish. I presume they understand English as I do, and I just talk. But they don't understand English as I do because English isn't their mother tongue. And this, we, when we communicate, we always presume that the other person understands us as we understand ourselves. It's just a human thing, even though we know we can be misunderstood. But the problem is when you're a teacher, you've got to have that in your real focus of awareness. Because every day we do this naturally, but we don't actually stop and take a step back and say, how could I have done that differently to make this communication work? Okay. So what is meant by the social semiotics? It sounds like a cliff. Some people think, well, what is this? Well, we kind of understand what semiotics is. It's about, and most people think about semiotics as being just about language. But it's about all forms, it's about all forms of communication. And you'll notice when I'm talking, now I'm moving my hands. That's part of a communication, some form of communication. So if you can imagine that you've got a particular social group. Now I want you to think about whatever discipline that you work in as being your particular social group. And then I want to take, take that one step later, take that into your classroom. Now, you're now talking to this particular level of, of education that you're dealing with. Now, you're in a particular social group. Now, that becomes realized through the use of semiotic resources. And I'll, ex you, I'll explain it for those people who don't know what do I mean by that. But it becomes realized through the kinds of way you say and do things and the kinds of things that you use. Now, okay. So, let, let's give some examples. So, and some of them we share, but these are mainly the examples that I know from physics. Typical things would be mathematics, diagrams, sketches, gesture, games, equipment, <coughs> spoken languages, written languages, and these are often referred to in terms of being representations. So you do all of the things. So if I was teaching something, I might be writing down some mathematics, I might be talking, and I might be constructing something with my hands like this for the students, gestures. I'm, I'm using my facial expression to try and t tell them something or, or emphasize something or move against something. All of this becomes part of what is happening. And the particular meanings that are construed from these different resources is negotiated within that group. Now, in this sense, when you're doing disciplinary education, it's not open to, to negotiation. If I'm talking about physics and I'm talking about momentum, you can't decide what momentum should mean. Momentum, you have to understand momentum as the discipline has decided momentum. If you're studying to become a medical doctor, 
and they're talking about, let's say, high blood pressure, then you need to understand high blood pressure from the medical point of view. You know, everyday life, we've got an idea of what high blood pressure, it just means, well, you know, they put this thing on your arm, the but there's a whole lot of understanding that goes with that, that the discipline is constructed. Oh, by the way, wherever I'm referring to these ideas and things, wherever they've come from, I've just added at the bottom the references, and if you want any of them, you can get them from me afterwards. Okay, so let's introduce some social semiotic ideas that our research team seem as being relevant. Okay, what if you think in these semiotic terms, I'm going to try and make an argument. If you think in these semiotic terms, then it's going to facilitate something. So when you think in one way, it facilitates something else. So you know that's always in some kind of, any kind of scenario, thinking in a certain way facilitates something else. In this case, it facilitates seeing how knowledge gets re represented as being a crucial dynamic of meaning making. So if you don't think semi semiotically, you won't understand that. You won't think how the knowledge gets representation is a crucial dynamic of the meaning making that your students are making. So what don't, the result of that is teaching then becomes telling. All I need to do is tell you, and if you don't get it, you're not smart enough. So without that, teaching becomes telling. It, it becomes what I'm doing now. It's just say it, give examples, and if you, if you ask a question, repeat it. It also facilitates seeing how the form of representation is integral to making learning possible. Because learning isn't something that, it's not like a switch, on or off. There's all, there's all kinds of possibilities that take place. So you've got to see if this is what starts to make something possible. It also facilitates how the ways that an object of learning gets, how you represent it, how you deal with that object of learning, shapes what is learned and how it is to be learned. So the way that you deal with it shapes for the students what they should learn and how it should be learned. Now you can imagine, I, I can remember uh, many years ago studying to get my driver's license and you know you had to learn all of this stuff. How did you learn? Did you, I don't know if you got your driver's license, did you try and understand all this stuff you have to learn or did you know they're going to ask you this question I'm just going to know this stuff. I don't know if it's still the same, there's something like 27 places you can't park. <laughs> so you just kind of learn them, bar, 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 you know, one after each other. And you go there, and if you wrote that test a year later, you'd fail it. Because it was all, you just memorized it. So that shaped what is to be learned. There's this stuff, and it's only what it is in this book. I've got to get my license. I've got to know what's in this little book. And how am I going to learn it? I'm going to learn it off by Right. It facilitates seeing disciplinary learning in terms of coming to interpret and the using the meaning potential of the disciplinary specific semiotic representative resources, those things that are called representations, that have been assigned by the discipline. You've got to learn the stuff that the discipline has already established the meaning of. You've got to come to terms, we have to talk with them. It allows the identification of meaningful learning as it takes place. So you can start to, and this is where I'm going to give you the example, that's what I'm add there, which can show you as a teacher, you can start to identify when really meaningful learning takes place. Whereas if I was just a standard teacher talking right now and I'd given you some tasks to do, I'd have no idea whether you're learning anything at all. I'd just have to assume if you understand me, you've learned it. Or you'll learn it later. Alright, let me try and put this in another way. Because I'm going fairly fast, I have to put it in another way. So, wherever you see disciplinary, I want you to put whatever your discipline is. So if it was psychology or law or physics or chemistry, to change disciplinary and say that. So, in my case, I'd say physics ways of knowing. So disciplinary ways of knowing are, are represented by the disciplinary discourse. So but the discipline itself has its way of talking and sharing knowledge and doing things and counting whatever it means. And that discourse is made of, of semiotic systems, which in other literature they often refer to as modes. So they're different semiotic systems. So if you think about physics, and I'm sorry, I used that example. Physics dominantly uses mathematics as a semiotic mode. 
And I presume mathematics dominantly uses mathematics as its semiotic mode. So in teaching, you would probably go to the classroom and meet two dominant semiotics, blah, 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 and mathematics. So out of all available stuff that you've got, the teacher's using two. Here are the kind of examples I gave you. You have mathematical formulas, and I give you mathematical you have pictures, you have diagrams, you have sketches, gaze, apparatus, working practices, language spoken and written. You have simulations, you have imagery. Now, within each, the idea is in within each of one of these things, these semiotic systems, there's a whole range of semiotic resources. So, if you think about in mathematical formalism, you have equations, uh, graphs. And you have different, and then, then you've got a subsection, you have different equations, you have different formulas, you have different things. If you cho chose something like pictures, and you have different kinds of pictures that convey different kinds of information, diagrams, they convey, so you have all kinds of subsets of things. So, the, so you forget the idea of a semiotic system, and within that system, there are a number of resources that you can use to communicate. And the most important thing is you've got to be able to use those resources in the way that the particular social group that you know would be using them. So if you don't use them in that way, then you're, nobody can understand you and nobody, and when you join the community somewhere else, they will never understand you. Can I just pause a moment? Am I just saying stuff everybody knows? I mean, just tell me, you're boring me, go faster. I'm okay. Okay. Right, let's try and look at this more visually. I'm trying to try and give you an example. Let's suppose, because this means, if you, if you, if you take, if you believe me, there's some consequences to believing me, i.e. if you buy my argument. So if you buy my argument, there's some consequences to it. So this means, your access to disciplinary meaning. So matter, it doesn't matter what it was. There are disciplinary relevant things that you need to be able to notice. You don't have to notice everything, but there's certain things that you do have to be able to notice. And we call them DRAs, disciplinary relevant aspects. And they get distributed across these semiotic systems because you can't say everything in the same way. And I'm going to pause there a moment and give you an example. Hanji, can I use you as an example because I've done this before? Hanji and our old friends, Hanji's mom dies. I'm going to ask you to choose semiotically which is the best way of me telling her I'm sorry her mom died. I take up my mobile phone and I say sorry and I draw a little place with, a tear, with tears falling down on the little face and I send it to her. Option number one. Option number two, I'm going to say exactly the same. Sorry to hear your mom died, I did it on the email. Option number three. Brr, brr. Hello. I'm sorry to hear your mom died. Option number four. Hi, how are you doing? I'm sorry to hear your mom died. Option number five. Hanji. See, I'm sorry your mom died. Now, which semiotic was the most effective? Why? Because what did I do? I added in a semiotic, a hug. Everything else was the same. It was simply by adding in that one more dimension, I could say something that none of the other things could say. And we all know that. So here's what the idea is. This is the idea. So suppose there's some kind of, I call it a scientific concept, but any concept in your, just in your, in, that you can think of. This is a hypothetical one. Let's suppose it consists of these six facets. <laughs> maybe you can get access to these <laughs> facets, say three of them. Now I'm thinking in physics terms, maybe through mathematics. And maybe you can get access to some other two facets with diagrams. And maybe you could get access to these by actually being in the lab doing some experiment. And I'm not even sure how you get access to that. But if you want a holistic view, you need to be able to become competent in all of these semiotic resources. You can't just be competent in the mathematics. If you came to my class and I only did mathematics and words, then you're never going to get to understand this because mathematics doesn't access this. I cannot send Hanji a formula telling her I'm sorry her mother died. She will never get it. So this means, sorry, this means you think about it, the students need to achieve fluency, I put that in quotes, and a critical constellation of these things. 
whatever you teach in the middle. Right, whoops. Very quickly, let's suppose we've got an example. Now, I'm still giving some of the theoretical stuff. So if you talk about disciplinary affordance, so we've defined disciplinary affordance of a particular semiotic as potential to give access to something. It doesn't mean it will, but it has potential to do that. And here's a quick example from physics. If the, I'll just take this little mini here. Suppose this was a physics problem, solve, pro problem to solve, and you needed to solve it, you'd have to be competent in this semiotic system, you'd have to be competent in this semiotic system, because this is the only way you can solve it. Then to go to the next step, you'd have to be competent in this system, and, and you still haven't got the answer. And then to be able to get to this system, you have to be competent here. So you have to be competent in one, two, three, four systems before you can solve that problem. But I only told you mathematics. I only taught you that. You can't get there. Just another example of a system. So in molecular and atomic, I'm not going to go through the detail here. But in order to understand some small aspects of molecular and atomic modeling and physics, you've got to know what all of these things mean. And you'd have to know how they get coordinated together. Just to have to begin to understand it. You can't just take one of them. Let's use something more familiar from everyday life. Let's look at the particular social group. We're out trying to get a, a lift. All right? Now, it will change. I'm going to say, suppose you're sitting in the United States. That's how they're going to go for a lift. If you're sitting in South Africa, you don't see people doing that. They do, they do something else, right? They have something in their hand with some money in it, right? So the particular social group, these cars would understand this as something. I'm sure you would say, this driver understands this person wants a lift. If you're in the physics classroom and I use that, the people in my classroom are not going to understand that I want to lift. They're going to be thinking about there's a conductor that's carrying a current and this is where the magnetic field direction is going to be. So it is that particular, the rhythm that you've got to be able to recognize the rhythm aspects as a, as a function of its usage. It doesn't exist on its own. Right, and then I just as a joke said, okay, so what happens when you get this on your mo mobile phone? It also has some kind of movement, right? So I'm trying to think of a, a, of course these things that I've taught, you've got all these different semiotics, but you've got to coordinate them. So I, I'm going to use an example. Suppose you've got, you've got to learn to drive a car and you've got to take off on a hill. Now maybe I'm getting old, maybe you don't have to do that anymore, but when I've got my driver's license, one of the things you have to do is you have to take off on a hill. Now if you think about it, even if you don't have to do that for your license, if you drive a manual car, you've got to do that. So what do you got? You've got a clutch, you've got a brake, you've got an accelerator, and you've got a handbrake. And you've got to coordinate these things all together. And unless you coordinate them in a particular way, this won't work. You'll run backwards. You'll have an accident. So you, and it's got to be relevant. The steering wheel here isn't really isn't a vital. What you, how you hold the steering wheel in this case isn't a vital point. But these are the vital things. So you've got to know what's relevant at that time for this thing to work. And you've got to coordinate them perfectly. Now, this is what's really important. You have to practice this coordination again and again before you can become an expert. When you become an expert, you can start to leave out things. But until you're an expert, you have to be able to do all of that coordination, and we can all recognize it. Right, last one. Let's look at these examples from physics and chemistry, and I want to propose a way of identifying this meaningful thing. Right, before I go, I need to introduce you to this, this concept of a present. You see, in language, what we do in language is that as language grows, it embeds more and more meaning into things. So it becomes more and more packed. So it's what it, the meaning is less and less visible. And that's what's being called a present. So here's an uh, this is an example, modern and worth giving example of a tabletop. So I, I want you to imagine, just look at the top of this, this thing that you're sitting at. So if you just lean over it in a moment and have a look at it. And then I want to, I want to ask you a question. What's underneath here? If you look at the top of what's underneath here? Have you any idea what's underneath this table as you look down? You can't see it. But because it's a table, you know exactly what's underneath it. So you've learned as a disciplinary expert of tables what lies underneath tables when you're sitting at it. You know that. And you've come to do it. But the thing is, in the disciplines, the things that are at which the, the discipline has made a present, you cannot see them all. There's a nuclear power station sitting just outside Cape Town. 
buying electricity for ourselves, help, help South Africa once make a nuclear weapon. The whole thing that's hidden behind how that works is written E equals MC squared. The whole design of that nuclear power station and all of that stuff, the generation of electricity, making that nuclear bomb which they made, is all packed into that one little thing. Now that's why it's so hard for North Korea to make these things, because they can't unpack it. Unpacking it is extremely difficult. The discipline itself has got it, but it's all built into it. That all has to be unpacked. But that's what happens in our education. We have to be able to help the students do that. And so that's the grounding of what I'm going to talk about. How can students get to be able to help them start to unpack it? So in social semiotics, there's this idea of translation. Now, in translation, there's two things that happen. There's a thing which they call transformation and transduction. And these are the terms that they use. So suppose you're working within one semiotic system. So you're not moving from one to another, but within one system. So let's suppose, I'll give you an example. Suppose I write y equals, m, y equals mx plus c, and then I drew a graph of that. I'm in that same system. Those things say they're saying exactly the same thing. What is happening then is I'm just making structural changes. But what is if I have to go from one semiotic system to another? When I gave Honji a hug, I had to go from saying I'm sorry to another system. When I was in that other system, I had to do something. So when I'm in that other system, I had to do something else. I had to give her a hug. But when I gave a hug, something got happened. A hug doesn't say I'm sorry on its own. I lost I'm sorry. Something else came out there. I feel for you. You don't only hug people when you're sorry. You hug people sometimes when you're happy. Sometimes you hug people when you greet them. So when you change from across semiotic systems, you have entity changes. You have a loss and you have gains. And that's what's needed to be recognized. So I'm going to get, just for an example, I'm just going to take this transduction and use this as an example for you. Right. So remember DRAs, I meant are the disciplinary relevant aspects. Those things from the discipline that are, are really important. Okay? Often they're not seen. Often these things, they're a, pre, a, a prison. So I want you to think of your own discipline and think of all of the things that are hidden that you can't see directly. All right? A mediating tool, you need, what I'm going to, I'm just giving you some things because I'm going to use these words. A mediating tool, you need something to help you change it. I wanted to tell Audrey, what did I need? What was my mediating tool to help me change it? What did I need? I needed my arms. Something you need. You can't just change it. You need something to help you. I can't draw a little hug. That's why I laughed when I told you I sent on my mobile home. I draw a little hug. You know that is not the same as sending a hug. It never will be. You also need a persistent semiotic resource. You need something that you can build on, something that has to be set there, that you can coordinate things around. If you think about when you're doing your, starting your car, what's the most important thing you coordinate everything about? That handbrake. The whole coordination goes by that handbrake. The moment that handbrake goes down, the car cannot go back. That's the big coordination thing that you need. Right. Now, I know many of you are not from chemistry. I don't know if anybody's from chemistry yet. But I'm just going to use this as an example. So don't worry about the details, just look at the, the examples. What happens in stereochemistry, it's really important to understand what the molecule looks like and how does it look and how it's orientated, etc. And it's, it's, especially in medicine, it's a very, very important aspect of, of uh, understanding chemistry. Now, if you've got to understand molecules, they're three-dimensional things. But the problem is when I when I draw it, I can only draw two-dimensional, like this. So you've got to look at that two-dimensional, and you've got to see three dimensions. Is anybody here from chemistry? OK. So I suppose when you look at this, you can see the three dimensions, just like that, right? Who else in the room can see the three dimensions? Why can't we see it? We're outside of your social group. Within your social group, you've learned to see those three dimensions, just like that. Outside of your social group, why can't we see that? So they've got a, a name for that. Now I can do a transformation. Now remember, I'm staying in the same semiotic, and I can write it in another way to try and bring it out. It's called a dash wedge, and I can try and use these little these things here to try and bring out the three-dimensionality. 
Now again, I'm asking you, if you're not in chemistry, did that suddenly make it three-dimensional for you? Probably not. You know? Then I could explain to you, well, you see, this means coming away, and that means going for, something's coming towards you, and something's going away from you, etc., or something. Or I could make a transduction. I can move to a new semiotic system made up of connections like this. Now you can see this. And I could actually build it, a model of it. So I could move to an abort and stick model. So it just change the semiotic system completely so that you begin to see what happens. Let's look in physics. Now, this is a very common thing that started to be used in the laboratory to make measurements. And on over here, you can see it's got a drawing of a coordinate system. Now, that's meant to be a three three dimensional coordinate system. So you can only draw two. So you go x and y, and then there's a little dot there. And that dot means it's coming towards you. And if you want it to go away from you, you put a little thing so it looks like an arrow at the back. You put a little cross, it means it's going away. So you've got to really see that three dimensional. What you can do. You can do a transformation and you can draw it that way. Instead of drawing a dot to mean going away and a cross mean coming towards, you could draw it like that. And if you're trying to show that in different planes, you could still do another transformation and you could draw it like that. Or you could move to a new semiotic system, mathematics, where there's graph drawing, and you can try and draw what's happening here like this. So when something's happening here, you can understand it by these things here. Don't worry about the details. Or you could think, here's an I dimension, you could move back to something like this, and you could say, oh, well, let this be my three-dimensional system, my X and my Y, and, and I could do another transduction like that. So that's an example. All right, so let me situate the usage of the example. Let's create, then we have this chemistry and physics. Again, let's try and look. So the first one, you want access to the eight present three-dimensionality. That three-dimensionality that you cannot see, you need to have access to it. That's the structure of molecules. And the central uh, semiotic fluency you want is a dash wedge diagram, which I showed you earlier. All right, let's look at the physics. Access to the A prism calculation and variance of a frame of reference. Now, don't worry about the details. It just turns out in physics that some things don't change when you measure them. Right, right. And uh, let me give an example, the speed of light. The speed of light's always the same. If you're on a train and the train's going 100 kilometers now, why wouldn't you jump off the train? Because you're doing 100 kilometers now. But this, the light on the front of the train, when the train is standing still, or if it's moving, that speed stays the same. That's the most amazing thing. So revolution in physics. Everything else, the speed changes, except for light. It's always the same. You can't make it go faster. I can pick you up and run with you and make you go faster. I can put you in your car and, and drive you and make you go faster, but your headlights will never go faster. The actual light stays the same speed. So this is these, the, the calculation invariance. So this means if you have a frame of reference, it doesn't matter where you are, I can figure out what's going on. And if it wasn't for that, you wouldn't dare get an airplane fly to another country because they wouldn't know where you are. Planes would be crashing all over the place. So that means it doesn't matter where the tower is, I can always figure out where you are, what you're doing, and how it is. And it doesn't matter whether you're in or where it is, they know exactly what's going on. But you need students to appreciate that because they never see, if you look in the textbook, the coordinate systems will all look the same. Right? And the semiotic fluency, the graph plotting three dimensionally, the magnitude of values. That's what it's said. Mediating tools in chemistry, we're going to give them this thing where they can build models. In physics, there's going to be this thing called an IO lab, and it's going to be connected to a computer. Right. Chemistry students, they were university first year, they're pharmacy majors, organic chemistry, five week course, they're dealing with serial chemistry. Right. Now, Okay. Please don't worry about the details. The two people here from, from the no chemistry are understand, but these are kind of important things that you need to know. You need to know whether the uh, two molecules are identical, the other one, whether they have mirror images, they're called enantiomers, and uh, the other one, they're not identical and they're not mirrors, diastereometers. You know, and this is a real important thing for students to be able to tell the difference to. They've got to be able to tell the difference. It makes a real big difference when you're making, when you're looking at molecules and understanding what's going on with it. Now, these are dash wedge diagrams, so you've got to be able to look at those and immediately tell what's going on. Can you imagine how complicated that is? And this is a tiny little bit in a, in a chemistry introduction course, five week course, two, three days. So this is what the class they get. They get given these things and they get asked to try and tell these differences. 
So what I've got here, now these are, sorry, I think it's going to be okay, I'll turn on now. These are Swedish students, so I've put the, the, the translations on the, on the, on the screen. So. But hopefully you can hear. into this molecule and then make decisions about whether they're identical, whether they're mirror images, whether they're identical, etc. Right? Now, so let's try and see what's going on over here. And I, this, don't even bother about this, this is just for the chemistry folk that know some chemistry. This is the important thing in the room for the rest of you. The students display, if you listen, what they do is they combine disparate convention, they, they use the convention, but they also use their own alternative inventions. They created their own alternative transductions. And that's, the students are formulating entity changes that are easier for them to handle, both concretely and visually. And so, and my claim is that allows you to see the emergence of learning taking place, meaningful learning. When you see them both using what the discipline does, but also making their own inventions to make it easier to handle. Suddenly you can, instead of that just looking like garbage, like it probably did look to you, you can see meaning in it if you're a teacher. And that's why I sp specifically chose these examples. Let's choose another example. So now, I, I hope that raised your awareness up a little bit. Now you've got to rather look very carefully about what the students are doing and what they're trying to do. Okay, did you notice? Now I get it. So let's try and see what's happening here. They can't determine if the models are mirror images of each other when they're placed behind one another and viewed from the side. So conceptually, they've got to figure out if you put them like this and you view them from the side, you can't tell whether they're there. What you've got to do is you've got to look down the central bond. And that's what they discovered. By actually having the transduction and making this thing, and actually trying it, trying it from the side and then trying to, suddenly they figured it. Suddenly they noticed something becomes existent. The relationship between the models becomes discernible and understandable. In their thing, now I get it. Now you can see the emergence of meaningful learning taking place. And I think they're so neat examples. Let's try one more. Just to see things. Right, so one of the most critical things is whether, it can whether you can turn it or not. So if you're looking to see whether uh, things are identical or mirror images or not or something, can you turn this around to make it or not? And if you can think about it, if, you could, if you're not in chemistry, think about it in this way. If it's a single bond, you can turn it, but if you had a double bond or a triple bond, it would be fixed and you wouldn't have to. And of course, the one, the, the, the one student asks, are you allowed to turn it? And I remember that being in class. Are you allowed to? And the other one says, yeah, look. See what the transduction did to them. It opened up for them the possibility to see something new. So what happens? New insights into the critical molecular properties in ways that allow them to do the required tasks. So suddenly they can see things they couldn't see before. 
Okay, let's look at some examples then. Let's look at the physics example. These are advanced level secondary school. Now, this is a secondary school in, in Sweden, which means it's the same as being the first university in, say, South Africa, any of the Commonwealth countries, the United States. It's been like British A levels, if you know that. Okay. okay, they're in a physics laboratory class. They're doing group work exercises dealing with the direction of the in the field. And this is where Trevor Falkfeld, I told you about, he was uh, collecting this data. So let's try and give you an example. Now, now, in physics, you know, we the magnetic fields. And so in physics, we have to model these magnetic fields. But you can't see them. You're in this room, the magnetic fields in this room, but you cannot see them. If I'm telling you the model looks something like this. And so if you look down in South Africa, you would expect the magnetic field to be coming out of the ground and going that way. And if you were living in Sweden, you expect it to be doing the opposite, coming that way. So what they get asked, they get asked to find the direction of the Earth's magnetic field in Sweden. I mean, the, the direction is not a given. And the main thing is to see the calc. We want them to see the calculation and variance of a physics frame of reference. That is, that coordinate systems are not in a fixed orientational position. Now, I don't know if you can remember whenever you did some maths or something. Whenever you do textbooks or anything, they always show you the coordinate systems this way. So what happens is students start to believe coordinate systems always have to look like this. Mm. And that you can't move them, you can't rotate them and use them like that. They're fixed. And what you want to know to them, if you use a coordinate system and you're there, if I've got a coordinate system and I move the coordinate system here, I still know where you are. If you leave South Africa and you go to America and I move the coordinate system to America, I know where you are while you fly. Right. So. Let's go and have a look. Here well, you can see them, and I'm not going to play the videos because of the time. I'm just going to show you over here. So look, let's have a look and see what's happening here. Yeah. So here's the mediating tool, which I've got this box. That's connected to the computer. So here we've got Gage. The girl is orientated. Orientated, she's talking. He's talking while he's looking there. So as they are doing the transduction themselves from the from the orientation to the computing and watching what's happening, look what he says. What happens if we move it? Look at that, holy crap, you couldn't believe it. So he's got all the way, let's say, to, the, to first year university, through the trick kind of thing, and that's the first time he's realizing, what the, is that possible? Okay, so now what they do, they have, all of them had to then, they got given this red arrow and they had to put these, stick the red arrows when they figured it out. So they all of the students in the class, they've stuck the arrows, and they all got figured out in their classroom, this is the way this magnetic field. Now remember this magnetic field is, is a, concept, a construct, it's a concept. You can't see it, but if you're in the discipline, it's there. Take out your compass, take out your mobile phone, and, or if you like, and look there, and look, have your compass, it'll tell you where the north is. How does it get that? There's this thing in physics, which you call a magnetic field, and it's all plotted there. So they get it done. But look what happens. This is what's interesting. Which they've never done before. This near the end of the exercise, they start to construct their own transduction. Starts to make a discipline, the discipline does this, starts to make their own transduction to a new semiotic system. And that shows you they're starting to understand what's going on. So while she turns that, she's now doing so now she's explaining to her colleague. You see, as this happens, this is what's how these two things work. So she's making the connection from here through to the commuter, back to her head. So you look at the commuter, you see. And then she constrain, takes another one, which is classical in the physics, makes a new one, and there looks at the computer with him and shows how the changing of that, things to that, and so on. I.e., there's a critical constellation that they are coordinating together to make meaning. And so when you can observe that happening, you say meaningful learning is starting to take place. So instead of just seeing that it's just some activity happening in the, in the laboratory or in the classroom, whatever it is, you can suddenly see learning taking place. So it's not just students doing things. That's what my claim is. It's not you're learning to see not just things happening, but seeing learning taking place. Okay? So let's have a look about the new semiotic field in the was learned. What was common? They were learning alignment and rotation. In chemistry, they learned the dash wedge. In physics, they learned this graph, this mathematization. In 
that this, this is what was happening in these transductions that took place. If you look about it, the emergence of new meaning. Evidence of disciplinary A presentation is starting to become present to them. This is evidence. They're starting to see the things that the discipline sees all the time for themselves. And these are quotes from the video. Now I see. Now I see it. Now I see. It's 90 degrees angle. There are. So this is so cool. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. And this is to themselves, talking to themselves. So the first time they begin to see things they couldn't see before. So, if you are developing a semiotic, a multimodal theory for identifying meaningful learning, first of all, you would have a present disciplinary aspects, i.e., those things you can see. You would have the formulation of transduction using some mediating tool which you need that would allow the emergence of what's a present to come out, to be able to see what's important. Emergence, that's the start of the journey. If you take a glass and you drop a, a drop of, say, ink in here, and slowly, it will, you know, over time it will go. That's called an emergence. So a slowly insisting changes and grows and grows. Maybe it's not happening like this, but it's the start of the emergence of learning to take place. It's part of that journey. And it's sort of the learning to become fluent in a critical constellation of those semantic resources. The four natural fruits of numbers two and three, they get coordinated together into a collective disciplinary performance. So when you start to coordinate all of these ideas together, remember those girls with said they were talking about whether you can rotate or not. They started to coordinate that with the task to start to understand. So gaining new access to a present here DRAs, just be rid of the aspects, comes through mediated transductions. So I'm using that as an example to try and convince you that thinking in a social semiotic way, thinking in a multimodality way as a teacher actually opens up your eyes to seeing learning in a whole new ways, but it also makes you think about your own practice. What about the semiotic resources that you are using? Are you using what they need to get a holistic understanding of what's going on? Okay, thank you. Dimensional stereocenter in their hands, and you can't teach diastem and stereocenter unless they've got two stereocenters in their hands. Of course, you have to do it, else it just doesn't make sense. And all examinations in chemistry allow you to take models into an examination to actually build the stereocenters. And uh, it is the only way you can teach it. Because so, Mike, that, no, see, now that's interesting, and I think that's because we had a look at classrooms. Do you know there are some teachers that don't do it? So we had a look. We had uh, this colleague, mine, Suzanne, and we had a look and we had to look. And so some people said no. But what was also very interesting is when we asked the students when they did the exams whether they want the models to use, they said no, the majority. They didn't want them. That was kind of usual. It was only, so it's only if they had teachers like yourself that they had that appreciation of the value of doing it. And, I, and that's what I remember I said. It's the way it gets presented shapes what students learn. So in the other classrooms, the students couldn't see the importance of what you were saying now. For them, the important thing was, can they get the answer right? And the only way to get an answer right is to learn a whole lot of stuff. So you recognize this, get the answer. But, yeah, absolutely. And this is that, uh, from a chemistry perspective, I've read a number of articles where they use a PowerPoint to, to represent it. Before, it's, it's physical representation. One of those beautiful things see them in three dimensions and to see the representation. And I've read articles from overseas where at the highest levels they would rather that everything was drawn out on a board because they can see the way the thing's constructed. If you throw something in a PowerPoint slide, a complex molecule at a person and say that's it. And they then are faced with having to write an exam like this. They don't know how to construct it. And, and, and that's a very important part of teaching the, the more physical subjects which require this abstract right, thought. Sorry, can I just uh, take that out because yeah. I'm, uh, sorry, uh, I'm doing a lot of the video and then I'm doing the video and then it's been so interesting because, uh, and not that class, but another class where we had them engage with the holistic models and use it a lot and got very excited about what they were doing in the classroom. And then the course went on. And when they wrote the exam, we got permission to video them in the exam. So they had their ball and stick models, 
and they had the piece of paper where they had their uh, three, uh, their, their two-dimensional models, and they did not go to the holistic models. And we've just started interviewing. So, but the interviews we've been doing so far was they, when we asked them, they said that they were trying to work out the two-dimensional models, and we said, but in the in the class, you. you you used the, the ball and stick models and you, you saw you know, what we were trying to show you. And they were, yeah, but this was the exam and, and that was the question on the paper and I just worked, worked down the exam. So it's, I think it really comes back to the teachers um, and reinforcing that this is the way to go and that in the exam you're going to have the ball and stick models and, and that this is going to, afford, the ball, using the ball and stick model is going to afford the answer, getting you to answer the question correctly. Because they just, re in the, we were so disappointed because they've been so good and they just reverted straight back. So It's the link between the, what you see in two dimensions and three dimensions. When you had someone with a bag full of sticks and balls and then yes. say, right, use them. So I can convince the students I taught, you just need one stereo sensor, it will solve all your problems. And then you relate the color to whatever part of the molecule is around there. So then you write the color like this, and then you can relate it and hold it and turn it and then work out whether it's R and, and, and so it, it's a teaching process, absolutely. and that's what's missing. You can throw absolutely. toys at children, but if you don't tell them how, the how to relate them. And the teacher who we had introduced the intervention to her, and she was so excited about what her students were doing. She was terribly disappointed, obviously, at the, with the exam. And then we said to her, well now, you, let's think about your teaching. What can you then do in the classroom? So it was actually, we, we're still doing the follow-up uh, interviews, but it's, I think it's the whole process for the teacher has been such an aha moment. Because she thought just giving them the ball and stick models would make it all happen. And not a chance. So well, I think are, yeah. it's, it's I'd the... I'd like to talk to you. There's just one little thing missing. If you put the two together, the change yeah, the whole way. Yeah, yeah. So, there you yeah. are, the dean of the natural sciences is a social semiotic from <laughs> <laughs> It's the only way to teach. <laughs> Science. The thing is, the, okay, I mean, I, I've been, I've been sort of, but the thing is, you know, re, when you recognize it and you know it, it's okay. But if you don't recognize it and you know it, it's very difficult. Can I, can I point, I want to come, I'll give it to you, can I point, remember that example when I gave with the handbrake? You've got to practice all of the parts in order to, before you can take the shortcuts. But if you're a teacher and you always solve the problems using the shortcuts, that's what happens. The students have no idea about the missing parts, and that's what they're missing. But sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I want to pick up something that was mentioned. Um, in terms of the children who had engaged with this very interactive way of dealing with, with chemistry, was there a change in the, um, in, in the test results? But I'm picking up thing about the test. Uh, did the, the teachers observe that the children perform better? Well, well again, it all came down to the teacher because mm. if we, we had two sets of teachers, this right. teacher was, was really, they didn't, uh, you couldn't see it. We had another teacher who went more than we could, Mike was talking about, and really sh took the time to say, these ball and sticks is just not a, 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 a this, is, this is your mediating tool. If you want to see if these are identical or if they're mirror images, or I'm just using that language, this is what you need to do to, to see it. This is how it works. And that, that teacher, exactly as you were saying, there, the results were fantastic. But the, so for us, it was fantastic that it was such an eye opener for the teacher saying she just thought it was happening by giving them the ball and stick models and then playing around with it, which we video, and it was quite exciting what they were doing, and she just thought they'd make the translations and the transductions, that they'd see that, that on paper, that, 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 that dash line means this and that, and, they, and without the teacher taking them through, they didn't get it. So it really is about being, not just being an interactive classroom where you throw all these things at them, but thinking through what semiotic resources you're going to use and the affordance of them. What can this uh, two-dimensional thing on the page say? I mean, in physics, you're going to have these two-dimensional things, and they say something. But, but for, the, for the students, you need sometimes 
this extra mediating tool to get those aha moments. And, and the, for us, the, some of the greatest things have been the teachers realizing they just thought it would happen. And, and, it, and it didn't. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so you just listen and look at your examples. Yeah. Uh, the sort of uh, moving between systems almost se seems you seem to have a student or the students who are going between the concrete and the abstract, mm -hmm. but in a constructive way. That's, a, that's another way of thinking about it. In fact, I think one of these uh, PhD was showing how the benefits of, of, being, of teachers facilitating that happening yeah. can really help with the learning. But the, but the reality is, I, I, and I honestly believe it, is that, and I, it's not to criticize people. When you become so good at doing something, you don't unpack everything for somebody else because you show the expert way of doing it. So that, that necessity to come back to the concrete, as you talk about, gets left out because there's the assumption. There's the assumption that you can do it. Or the assumption that it's not your thing. Imagine if I'm teaching physics, and the people in my class turn out to be not very good at mathematics. If I take the attitude that becoming competent in this semiotic resource of mathematics is not my job, it's the department of mathematics, the majority of people in my class will fail. Because I'm not attending to them becoming fluent in that required semiotic resource. I'm saying it's somebody else's job. All I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the expert, the final part. I'm only going to show you the final part. And the number of people that can have access to that is limited. So that's, I think it was a very important point that what Anne was saying. It's not just knowing the semiotic source is and using them, but knowing what it can give access to. So again, if you look at what Michael was saying, he was just immediately describing by having ball and stick model, it gave access to blah, 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 blah. And that's what we need to do. You need to understand if you're going to use this, what can it give access to? There's no point in just using it. So in a sense, what you're saying is how you so your happiness information is how you design that learning experience. Yes. That is absolutely crucial. The way we say it is how the object of learning is handled. Yeah, that's a, if you look in the literature, that's always the way they always talk about how the object of learning is handled. How that happens, that everything else comes from that. If we've got if we've got one minute, I just want to I want to talk to what you said about Overhead, and I think it's a really important thing to know because they've done lots of research on it. This is probably one of the worst ways of learning. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, the, and I, this is not my opinion. I mean, I'll just report back to you what I've heard from the research from thing. First of all, no human being can multitask besides the jokes that we make that woman can and woman can't. That means if I'm talking, you cannot follow this and listen to me at the same time. You jump between the two. Now, if you're jumping between the two, you miss something. Try texting and driving. You jump between looking at the road, look down on But in between the jump, you can kill yourself. That's number one. Secondly, as a human being, you react best of all. The brain likes three-dimensionality, not two-dimensionality. Three-dimensionality, that's number one. And secondly, it must be moving. So that the brain will pay most attention to something that's moving. Do you know why I asked for this and not a pointer? Because pointers just aggravate most people. By making this and moving, you're paying attention to my movement. If I've got a little dot here that's sort of hazy all over here, you don't pay any attention to it anymore because that's just, it's, it's noise movement. So that's how that, and then the third one, the unpacking, the brain will always follow the unpacking. So if you've got a problem, if you come and sit down with me and I show you how to do something, I will engage with it far more than if you've already written down all the parts and say, well, you see, first you come here, and then you go here, and then you go here, and then you go here, because you're not coming with me. So, actually, at the University of British Columbia, they call them PPF presentations, PowerPoint free. Not like business. Take it away. They try to get to, to get practice. Stop relying so much on this, but unpack things for your students. This thing, the research shows, actually teachers move away from unpacking. Mm -hmm. Because they think by just showing you the image, it shows all. Mm -hmm. And what that means is, you see, when you're an expert and you see that image, you see everything that's a present to it. So you think, wow, like when I show you this picture. This picture doesn't mean much to you. 
but it means a great deal to me. Because I was on a, on a ship going up the coast of Norway, and this is where I took this picture, and it was just before uh, you know, the midnight sun, and it was the most amazing. So it was the most amazing experience. So this picture had meaning for me. When I show it to you, it's just a pretty picture. So everything that's say present in that picture, by just showing that picture, I cannot share with you. And even by telling you I was on a ship going up the course of the way, that's, what does that mean? You need to get on that ship to know what it feels like. Okay, thank you.